is the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. I'm Ashton Cohen. I'm joined today by Elaine Parker. She is the president of the Job Careers Network Foundation and chief communications officer of the Job Careers Network. And we're going to discuss what's going on with the economy, what kind of impact the Biden administration is having on the economy, what they should be doing, what they haven't been doing. So, Elaine, thanks so much for for being with me today. Thank you for having me, Ashton. Uh, Just to clarify, uh, for today's conversation, I am here in my capacity as the chief communications officer for the Job Creators Network. Okay, got it, got it. Um, So with respect to, let's start off with the, the kind of impact the Biden economic agenda is currently having on small businesses and the economy at large. What are the things that you're most concerned about? Well, um, just to give you a little background on Job Creators Network, we're a national conservative small business advocacy organization. And so um, we advocate and defend small businesses and and free market in general. Um, We we focus on lower tax policies like lower taxes and less regulations and pro-growth policies in general. Um, one of the one of the things, many of the things that we're concerned about um, is coming out of the uh, current administration, the Biden administration, um, are directly uh, going to impact small businesses, and and they seem to be focused um, in that direction primarily, um, or at least that's where you're going to see the outsides impact of some of these policies. And so we've been calling it a war on small businesses, um, and and these policies are are making it hard to. Um, um, find labor. It's making it hard for small business owners to run their businesses. It's increasing the cost of doing business um, with like gas and cost of goods. We're seeing um, prices inflating in a, in a rate that we haven't seen in a long time. And all of that impacts these small business owners. And after a year of a pandemic that I think we can all agree had an outsized impact on small businesses, um, not the larger businesses, they seem to do pretty well under, even under the pandemic, um, they're trying to survive and they're trying to uh, recover. And, and all we can do is, is try and focus on the businesses that actually survived the pandemic. And so we continue to um, advocate for those uh, small businesses um, for better policies and to push back on some of the threats like the higher taxes that are coming um, down the pike. And so with respect to the the higher taxes issue, what, what are you seeing? What are you concerned about there? And, and also tying it into the other sorts of legislative policies that you, that you see coming down the pike. Well, it, you know, it's interesting, you know, you continue to hear the talking heads and, and the Biden administration, the president himself, um, talk about how these taxes um, are not going to uh, impact anyone who makes under $400,000. So, uh, you know, that's that's most Americans. And so we all shut our ears and walk away and say, well, that doesn't affect me. That's in somebody else's yard, right? Um, but the reality is it does. It's going to impact our small business owners. And it's going to impact them in several ways. Um, there's more than a million businesses, small businesses, which the SBA defines as any company with um, employees under uh, 500 um, is a small business. So there are more than a million of those businesses that are structured as C corporations. Well, the Biden administration has a direct target on increasing um, the, the corporate tax rate as much as 30 percent. Um, and so those small businesses are going to be impacted. Um, and I know they keep framing it as oh, it's just going to be the big, large, evil, um, greedy corporations, but it's not. It's going to impact you know, over a million small businesses. So that's one way that we're going to hit um, small businesses and people who are under that 400,000 mark just by the simple way, the way they're structured. And what does that do? That impacts their employees, their ability um, to give wage increases, their ability to grow and, and create jobs. Another way that they're going to um, impact um, small businesses is any business that's structured like an S corporation, um, a pass through entity, S corporations, partnerships, sole proprietorships um, who pass their business income through to their individual um, uh, financial statements. Um, They are going to raise the top marginal rate um, and impact those folks um, as well. 
And so those are small businesses. And there are many, many small, millions and millions of small businesses that are structured as pass-through entities. Um, and then the last way is there is a proposal out there by Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon who wants to roll back uh, the 20% tax deduction, which is one of the centerpieces in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 that was passed under President Trump. Um, and what that did, and I always, you know, we fought very hard for, for that um, piece of legislation to be passed because we knew it was going to impact small businesses in such a positive way. Um, but what that does is it allows small businesses to shield 20% of their business income that they're passing through to their, um, to their regular personal income taxes um, and reinvest that money. And we know that after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed, that small businesses, in fact, did reinvest in their businesses. They did uh, hire more people. They did increase wages. They grew their businesses. They did everything they said they would do if President Trump passed this legislation. Um, and so now there's a, a proposal somehow on the table um, to, to pull that back. And, and again, I, I could go on and on about how this is all directly aimed at small businesses. The larger businesses can really afford to do to take on all of this um, probably, probably take it all on, but small businesses can't, especially since um, we're coming out of this pandemic. We continue to see um, uh, mandates, uh, the vaccine mandates coming at them. We continue to see all kinds of um, just barriers in general to running their businesses. Right, and, and you bring up an interesting point when you bring up the distinction between the small and large businesses. So during the pandemic, for example, uh, companies like Amazon benefited the most they had a disproportionate amount of, of, uh, of influence of share price increase, of capital increase, of sales increase, um, because I'm they're able of to- contributing to it. <laughs> yeah, I know, we, we all are. Uh, and and the, the, the mom and pop retailers or the mom and pop small businesses weren't able to, first of all, benefit from the same exemptions that were given to places like Costco, right? Um, and it's they like, were the ones. It's who like the virus them. didn't. The virus didn't go to Costco. It didn't right, go to grocery right, stores. Exactly. It didn't go to to Walmart. Mm -hmm. Apparently, because they were essential. They were essential to stay open. Right. And wheat stores small, as well, by the way. Yeah, but somehow small businesses they mm -hmm. weren't essential. They could be shut down, um, and so they were. And that is why they were just so disproportionately impacted by by this. Um, the pandemic, um, which, you know, it, it, you know, thankfully for policies like the Paycheck Protection Program that um, was passed last year and created a lifeline for directly for small businesses um, to help them get over some of the some of the difficulties and keep their employees, um, uh, you know, connected to the to the company and paid. I mean, uh, over five million companies benefited from the Paycheck Protection Program. It's said to have saved over 51 million jobs. I mean, that is probably one of the most successful government programs um, that I would ever point to. Um, and, and I'm not a fan of government programs, but that one was necessary for the time and, and for the, for the uh, emergency that was happening. With the Paycheck Protection Program, can, can you explain that for us, what that did? Sure. Um, last year, probably in 2020, probably around the March timeframe, um, we were working with Secretary Mnuchin um, on some of the ideas on how we could, um, and we were providing input on what the small business community was saying that they needed. And so a piece of legislation was created, um, uh, Senators uh, Marco Rubio and um, uh, Senator um, the senator out of Maine, which right now her name is escaping me. Oh. Um, yes, um, we're part of all of that. And um, what we were doing was trying to create a program that would provide um, eight weeks of, of basically payroll for um, small businesses to be able to keep their employees um, paid and keep their lights on um, and keep their rent paid. So they could essentially keep their doors open, even if their doors weren't open because they weren't essential. Um, and so, and these were going to be forgivable loans as well. 
Um, and there were specific stipulations set up on, on who could apply for the um, loans. They had to be deemed a small business. There was a couple other provisions in there. Um, but like I said, five mil, over 5 million companies um, utilized uh, these loans uh, to, uh, to keep their, their businesses running and keep their employees paid. So it was a true lifeline and, and extremely successful. Um, those forgivable loans, the, the program was renewed um, two more times after that. Um, but one of the big things and the big contributions um, that the Job Creators Network made was um, we knew that the Small Business Administration simply could not handle the kind of volume that was going to occur when they stood up this program. And so um, what our CEO, Alfredo Ortiz, um, was, uh, was talking to Secretary Mnuchin about and providing the input was we needed to find a way to um, get, the, get the money in the hands of the small business owners as fast as possible. And that was gonna be through the banks. So we literally made the banks the ATMs. Um, sounds pretty logical, right? Um, that's why all of it was executed at the banking level and not the SBA because the banks already, they, they are, we were already their customers, right? We all went to our own banks. Um, we applied for the loan. It was set up. It was a very easy, like almost a one page application. Um, and the approvals were coming through uh, amazingly fast. Um, and that was important because um, you know, I, I think the SBA serves an important purpose, but they could not have handled this program. I think we would still be trying to get money out the door if the SBA had been in charge. Right. I think that's a fair conclusion. And so with a payment protection program, that was a, a spending policy that I think a lot of us can agree on. It was a temporary lifeline, as you said, to corporation, uh, to small businesses um, to get them over the hump of this, you know, black swan event, this pandemic that ravaged all sorts of industries, particularly, as we said, the small businesses more so than giant corporations. Now we have all sorts of other spending measures that are being proposed by the current administration. Um, we see inflation becoming a problem again for the first time in a long time, like significant levels of inflation. They, they claim it's transitory uh, and that, uh, you know, supply chains and empty, empty stores are a, a indication that Americans are richer and spending all this money. Uh, what are you hearing from the small businesses in terms of their their fears about inflation? Are they talking to you about it? Are they talking to you about the supply chain issues? Do they have any sense of it? Are they concerned about it? Well, actually, we do a monthly poll of a uh, national poll of small business owners. It's, it's called the uh, Monthly Monitor. Um, we poll about 500 small businesses nationally um, and from anywhere from uh, two employees to 500 employees. Um, so really getting a sense of, of what they're feeling and, and what their optimism is. We do um, an SBIQ, which is Small Business Intelligence Quotient, we call it. And it's, it's basically their optimism index. Um, we started this poll in May, so we're starting to see some trends. Um, and back in May, um, we saw a, a much more positive outlook. Um, this is pre-Delta, uh, before the Delta vi variant really crested. Um, and we saw kind of a, a positive, they were positive going into the summer. Um, and then um, by about uh, July, August, we started to see a downturn. And so we've had two straight months of a downturn in the SBIQ um, and their optimism continues to go down. Um, one of their, their major, most major concern is um, inflation and the cost of goods. I mean, you see the cost of energy going up, the cost of gas going up, um, meat, pork. Um, you know, I always joke, who doesn't like bacon? Well, it's up 11%. Um, you know, meat's up almost 20%. Um, to rent a car is up uh, almost 40%. Um, gas is up 50%. Uh, I could go on and on. Everything is going up. And a lot of these companies, restaurants, whatever it is, are, are working on very slim margins, again, still trying to recover. Um, and they're not able to pass these costs onto, um, onto consumers so readily. Um, some of them are trying to, and so consumers are seeing the increase. Um, but the poll also shows that only about 10% of small businesses um, have fully recovered from the pandemic. Wow. So you're talking about 90% of our small businesses mm -hmm. that are still struggling to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and, you know, we've spent all of last year and or all of this year, sorry, um, basically up until Labor Day weekend, um, small businesses uh, has 
their second complaint, I would say, is, is probably the labor shortage. Um, mm-hmm. We're seeing the biggest labor shortage we've seen. I mean, it, it's crisis at this point, but it's a crisis that was government created. Um, and it was created because they were literally paying people to stay home. Right. Um, and, and so small businesses were competing with government for labor. And nobody can compete with the government. They have an endless, they have an endless bank account. Um, and that's our tax dollars. And that's exactly what they've been doing is paying people to stay home. That's ended, um, but we haven't seen uh, the rebound yet of people actually getting out there. We still have 5 million fewer people working than we had pre-pandemic. And we have almost double that in jobs available. So there's almost two jobs available for every person. Wow. Um, so there's a lot of choice out there. If you want a job today, you can go get one. If you want a new job today, you can go get one. If you want another job, if you want two jobs, you can go get one. Um, so it, it, it just doesn't make sense other than the policies that are coming out of this administration are not creating the same type of pre-pandemic prosperity that we saw under the Trump administration, which was not just pro-business, but I say it was pro small business. Um, and we saw that because small business really drove this economy during that entire um, term. And you may not like mean tweets and you may not like um, how he approached things and, and the things, some of the things that the previous president said. Black um, I get that. Sure. What'd you say? Black Rock didn't, right? The, <laughs> yeah. big, the big corporations did not like the previous administration. Yeah, I yeah, mean, I that. Yeah. but at the same time, when it, he's not coming to your house for dinner, mm-hmm. um, but his policies were impacting what you were talking about around your kitchen table. When's my next vacation? Um, how much is in my savings account? Um, you know, how, uh, how much more can we um, set up a savings account to put our kids in college? Those conversations were being had and those things were happening from Americans because of the prosperity. We saw wages grow um, at a rate that was faster than the previous decade. Um, average uh, hourly wages grew at 3%. They were actually growing faster than, than white collar workers, salaried workers. And those at the bottom of the income spectrum, the bottom 10%, they were growing twice as fast. Um, so people were earning more, they were keeping more of their money, and they were, they were living their life. So like I said, a few mean tweets, but your life was better financially, um, I guess I'd pick the other one. Mm-hmm. No, I think you hit an important point there. A lot of people forget. So right before the pandemic, the 2019 numbers, there was a $6,000 increase in the median wage for the average worker, the average family income, which was 45% higher than Bush in eight years or Obama in eight years. So Trump got a 45% higher increase in the way in the median wage of a, of a, um, of a family, median income of a family in one year than they did in eight years. Uh, but yeah, over overshadowed by the mean tweets. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. and, and that's unfortunate. During, during the seven, from 2017 to 2019, after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed, 6.6 million people were pulled out of poverty because of the prosperity under, under the previous administration and the policies that allowed businesses and small businesses in, in particular um, to grow this economy. 6.6 million people. So when you hear people like Senator Bernie Sanders um, and, and uh, AOC stand up there and talk about a $15 minimum wage and um, we've got to have a living wage, well, most many companies, most of them that I speak with, they say, well, I've got to pay more than that anyway. Right, right. right. Um, you know, so why have a government mandate? It's happening. It is happening. It's not a win for them, but we have to let the natural forces work. Um, and when we do that, uh, you know, and it's not government induced, we see the record um, unemployment that we, you know, saw. we saw the largest workforce that we had ever seen ever in the, con- in the country um, under the Trump administration just before the pandemic. But every demographic across the board benefited, That's whether right. you were white, black, Hispanic, Asian, um, even felons, even convicted felons had the lowest unemployment rate. Um, so I could go on and on about what the benefits of those policies were, but it's 
yeah, I don't know if you're a Seinfeld fan, but I was a Seinfeld fan. Mm. It, it was like bizarro world. Um, for me, when I would listen, when I listen to how it's described um, by President Biden, by the Democrats, by some of the senators that I referenced, um, when they talk about how bad it was under the Trump administration, um, because he truly created an environment that um, President Kennedy said, um, a rising tide lifts all boats. That's exactly what we saw for everyone. Right. And, and even with the, uh, I remember the, the black unemployment rate was the lowest ever at something like, uh, I forgot the exact percentage number, maybe, you know, but that was lowest ever. The Hispanic unemployment rate was lowest ever. Um, and so I, I actually want to ask you, so obviously, as we discussed, Trump had a, had a uh, fairly significant increase in, in the uh, median household income in his time in office prior to the pandemic. But it's a blimp because overall, since say the 1970s, um, for the middle income middle income families and below, uh, you have seen a largely flattened out wage curve up. Is there anything that the so J job creators network, any sort of legislation or reforms that that they really look at in terms of lifting up that? Uh, both making it a more prosperous economy for small businesses and for employees. Like, what sort? What, what do you think are the biggest sorts of impediments to lifting those people out of that sort of flattened curve of of wages that's been going on for almost fifty years, largely? Well, well, look. So the crowd that that pushes the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, you know, the living wage. Um, when we actually went down into the, it was really boring stuff, but into the data of, of the BLS um, data to look at who's making below minimum wage, who who's making minimum wage, sorry, you can't make below minimum wage, who's making minimum wage at this point. Um, and we took a look at who they were, how many they were, and what their age bracket was. And, you know, it turned out that, you know, there's only... So, so let's kind of walk through life, right? Um, if you look at the folks under 24 years old, that's kind of when you're done and out of college and everything like that. So there's only about, was about 200,000 people in the whole country um, who, was, who were making um, minimum wage, probably through no fault of their own. Um, and so I would rather take, I would rather focus on developing programs where we can identify those people um, and, and get them the training that they need. We have the resources in place. Um, heck, we have the training facilities in place. I've been to vocational schools um, and visited many of them and seen how, uh, you know, how they're turning out people who have skills um, that can get jobs and, and get them these 50,000, instead of trying to get them $15 an hour, let's get them a $50,000 a year career right. that they can grow in. So because if you're if you're, you know, 25 or, or 35 years old trying to raise a family um, working at McDonald's, that's not a career. But if we get you out of that job and we give you $15 an hour to do that, you still don't have any more marketable skills. But if we get you out of that job and get you training into some of these, um, you know, middle class jobs, um, you know, in the medical field or um, even police officers or um, plumbers. I mean, gosh, I joke all the time that in my next life, I'm going to come back as a plumber because it, they make so much money they <laughs> and they have yeah. no college yeah. debt. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. so identifying those people, um, I think would really go a long way instead of focus on uh, government induced band aids uh, like fifteen dollar an hour wages. Because what's going to happen is the people who are currently making fifteen, sixteen, seventeen dollars an hour, um, if they've got and they've been doing this job whatever it is for so long, somebody comes in and the base wage is fifteen dollars an hour. Guess what that eighteen dollar an hour person wants? more money. Mm -hmm. So you have upward wage compression. So the impact on small business isn't just the bottom level coming in, but it's all the levels coming in. Um, and again, the person who makes $15 an hour working at McDonald's still doesn't have any more skills. They're not any more marketable. They don't have a career. Um, and so those are the things to consider. But you know, unfortunately, there are those in the government that think that they know best, even though they have never run a business, they've never signed the front of a paycheck. Um, they should really talk to the small business community and they should really talk about what it means to run a business and, and what it means to employ somebody and be responsible for their livelihood. 
Absolutely. I think one of the, uh, one of the things I always look at in Europe for Germany and Switzerland do a really good job at the vocational training skills there. That's why they have some of the, the most uh, sort of artisanal respected products is they get a lot of people into these programs early on. Um, I think one of the things that people in my age group and, and even younger are starting to realize is that college degree, if, if it's a worthless degree, you're coming out with a hundred grand in debt or something like that. And then you, you still have no skills. Uh, and then you can sort of understand why socialism is becoming a, uh, you know, a, a sort of more popular topic, unfortunately, uh, and belief system is because these people are promised that if they go to college, they'll come out with a job, but then they go to college and they're not being taught any actual marketable skills. Uh, and in fact, they're, they're, I've met some people who are worse off from going to college seriously, you know, in terms of the ideas that are fed into their head and the, uh, the sorts of bad ha habits that they develop. Um, and then they come out with a degree that's just worthless. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Well, cer certainly being a college student is a great life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, have, I have a senior in college right now and she lives a great life, um, but she is pursuing um, a marketable career. She's gonna be mm -hmm. a nurse. Um, you know, but she has friends who are focused on, you know, uh, degrees that I frankly have never heard of, mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to make fun of them on air, um, but degrees that I just never heard of, and I can't see a job at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you ask them, they can't see a job at the end of it either. It's interesting, um, and it's, it's a great thing. These are great things to learn about. But um, if you can't see a job at the end, particularly if you're going to take on $100,000 in, right. um, in college debt, um, you know, then, then that's probably not the career for you. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and, the, and this, this college debt is, is a big problem. And now you've got, um, you know, some of the bills go, making its way through Congress that are going to forgive, you know, they want to forgive all of it or portions of the college debt, you know, and as somebody who... Um, you know, who paid, did the paygo plan, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, you know, it doesn't seem fair that other people would have, you know, other taxpayers would have to foot that bill, um, especially if the careers aren't, there isn't a job at the end of that um, degree. Um, but you're right about Europe, they do have a great public uh, private partnership um, in training people and getting people for uh, to, to have skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and it, I, I think it's a difficult one to solve as well, is because you have a was a two trillion dollar problem now with the student loan debt, um, and if our population of youngsters are saddled with this, and the kinds of people that we're competing with internationally aren't, so what's that going to do to entrepreneurship and the future small businesses that are going to be created when people are saddled with this sort of debt, and so. You know, I, I, I'm still trying to figure out and research a solution in my mind. I, I think it has something to do with, um, you know, maybe not giving out loans to certain degrees that aren't, you know, that aren't going to actually lead to anything productive uh, or th that, you know, maybe if you have a, you know, like nursing or, you know, I'm, I'm an attorney, but I, my college degree wasn't as a political science, which you know, it was sort of a patter degree in order to get my GPA up to, <laughs> to get a scholarship in the law school. But, uh, you know, may, maybe that there needs to be some sort of uh, distinction between that. Uh, but then you still have to solve this $2 trillion massive crisis, which is, which is a whole, whole different ballgame. Uh, I know that the Job Careers Network is launching a suit with respect to the vaccine mandate. Can you just can you talk a little bit about that as well? Sure. Last month, um, as you know, uh, President Biden announced um, a vaccine mandate, which um, went back on, obviously, his word um, that he promised that he would not do that. Um, but it really has is going to impact small businesses. And we really took issue um, with how they framed um, the description of what this mandate was, that it was going to impact just our large companies. So when you think of that, who do you think of? United, Delta, Walmart, you know, very large companies that could take on and stand up a process, um, a, a program like this within their companies. Um, but really who it's going to impact um, is it went way down into the lower um, employment numbers and it's a hundred employees or more. 
Um, and so you're talking about, you know, the SBA, the, you know, Biden's own SBA defines a small business as any, any company with less than 500 employees. Um, and so at, in, at the same time, we've been traveling around the country. I've been meeting with small business owners um, on a tour um, to stop the war, um, to, to stop the war on small businesses, um, literally on a bus tour traveling from state to state. We've done about eight states in the last two months. Um, and these small business owners are in that, you know, 100 to 150, maybe 200 employees. Um, and they're very concerned about how it's going to impact them. I met with a, a trucking company in uh, Minnesota. It's got about 150 employees from, you know, internal office personnel to tech technicians who work on the trucks to the truckers themselves. Um, and there's a large percentage of his workforce that does not want the vaccine. They don't want to be um, vaccinated. They're, and so what's the alternative? You have to do weekly testing. How does he set that up? How does he fund it? Right, right. Um, how does he track it? What are the costs involved there? And if he's not compliant, $14,000 fine um, per non-compliance. Uh, that's pocket change for Delta. It's mm -hmm. not pocket change for him when he's already struggling with his uh, labor issues. And, and, you know, frankly, what is the science between 99 employees and 100 employees? Mm -hmm. Does the virus somehow not go into right, those exactly. companies? <laughs> there, there's some, it's just an arbitrary number um, and, and it impacts small businesses. So we um, have we can't file until the rule actually comes out. But we are going to file suit along with some of our small business owners when the rule is released. And we're going to block this mandate. Um, because it is unconstitutional. Yes, it is a complete overreach um, by the Biden administration. Um, and OSHA really, OSHA does not have the regulatory okay. authority mm -hmm. um, for this. They are focused, their focus and their, their, the reason why they were formed is for workplace safety. This is a healthcare issue. This is not what they are, are deemed to regulate. So it is a clear overreach. We believe that we will um, be successful in this lawsuit as well. I think so as well. Uh, with respect, and they don't even have a carve out for somebody who has natural immunity, which as the, the most comprehensive study that just came out on this shows that people with natural immunity who recover from COVID have a six to 13 times greater resistance from infection of COVID again. And so that's a completely legitimate reason not to take the vaccine. And they don't even make that carve out. And like you said, it's arbitrary, 99 to, to uh, 100. What, what, what changes there exactly? Exactly. And, and as a matter of fact, one, uh, we do have um, some employees who are interested, who are, who are joining the lawsuit, who don't want to be vaccinated um, because they had the virus. Um, and, and I just want to make something clear to your, your viewers. This is not, an, we're not anti-vaxxers. Right, this is not about anti-vaccine. I'm personally vaccinated. Um, I didn't have the virus, so I didn't have any antibodies. Um, but, you know, and we encourage, you know, everybody who needs to get the vaccine to get the vaccine. But this is about the, the impact it's going to have on small businesses, that these decisions, we do believe these decisions should be made, um, you know, between you and your doctor, um, that they should be made in the exam room and not the lunch room, really. Um, and so that's why we're going to, to block this. But we are being contacted all over the country from small business owners saying, you know, can I join the lawsuit? You know, please, I, I can't do this with my workforce. Um, from South Carolina to, to Minnesota, um, we're hearing from small business owners. Yeah, absolutely. It, and with respect to the, the non-compliance uh, penalty, can the employer be penalized multiple times for one non-compliant employee? The way the reports that I've seen is that it's per non-compliance, okay. so you can get multiple fines. Um, and of course, there's a provision in there that's going to be in the rule that encourages um, employees to tattle on their bosses, mm -hmm. basically, and report them. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you guys are, are leading the charge on that, being a part of, of the suit for that, because I, I cannot see a way in which this is deemed constitutional. I know that the, the We've had a little bit of trouble in the past before with uh, the Roberts Supreme Court not wanting to get involved political opinions, but you know, trying to pass this through emergency, uh, through the ETS, through OSHA, um, on a on a, in a virus that's worldwide that's been uh, around for a couple of years, is is just ridiculous and such a federal overreach and arbitrary as you mentioned as well based on how it's being implemented. Well, and not only that, we are seeing hospital virus cases, hospitalizations, and death continue to fall. 
And so even, even if OSHA had the constitutional authority to do this, which we don't, we don't believe they do, but even if they did, the basis for saying we need to do this under ETS is not there anymore um, because of the cases continue to fall. Um, and, and so you have to start to recognize, uh, you know, the herd, the herd immunity piece, that vaccinations, uh, voluntary vaccinations continue to increase um, every day, every week. Um, and so with that, we are going to reach herd immunity. Um, but yeah, there are people, you know, I, I have a colleague who um, his doctor recommended that he not get the, the vaccine because he has certain health issues. And so the doctor weighed um, what is he more in jeopardy of? Is it getting the vaccine, getting the virus and what it could or couldn't do to him, um, you know, or um, getting the vaccine? And because there are now um, the prophylactics have come out, the treatments, um, approved treatments are out from Merck, um, as well as if you have the virus, uh, there's the antibody treatments. Um, so all of those things can reduce the severity of the virus if you get it. But this particular colleague of mine, his doctor said, because of this particular vaccine, your health issues, it's not a good idea. There's a lot of people out there like that. And for whatever the reason, um, can't get uh, the vaccine. So that's why these decisions, we really think they should be made between you and your doctor and not between you and your boss. All right, absolutely. And uh, last thing I want to ask you, what, what's, what's one thing, what's one sort of piece of legislation or reform or thing that you'd like to see enacted uh, that you think would be the most beneficial going forward? Let's say the president actually listened to you. Uh, what would be the so what would be sort of your your top priority or the job careers network sort of top priority in terms of uh, getting moving this economy forward and getting out of this sort of malaise that it seems like we're in? Yeah, uh, we've made a lot of comparisons to uh, the Jimmy Carter presidency. Mm -hmm. Um, a piece of legislation, I, I don't know that I'm going to point to a specific piece of legislation. I think I'm going to point to what we saw um, pre-pandemic um, and the, the type of prosperity that we saw um, just from a piece of legislation called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, the deregulatory um, nature of that administration um, and removing barriers for businesses, small businesses, so that they could um, grow more and grow better. One of the things that we were excited about um, we were very excited about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The idea that we could start to, um, you know, that was the first time in 30 years that we had touched the tax code, right? Um, is that we didn't go another 30 years um, again, and that we continue to even annually or every couple of years, look at the tax code, see how it's impacting growth, see how it's impacting um, ordinary Americans and small businesses, and constantly improve it. Going 30 years with a with um, you know one piece of legislation that has such an impact on all of our lives, we thought we thought this would be an opportunity to see constant improvement. Um, that's how entrepreneurs think. That's how the right. previous president thought constant improvement. Um, and so um, you know we were excited about the prospects of of those types of things mm -hmm. being seen on a continuous basis. Um, the other uh, area that we haven't touched on at all is, is healthcare, um, and and it, that is sort of the looming um, threat out there, which I believe we'll start to see that come to um, light more, um, probably spring or summertime as we get closer to the midterm elections. Um, obviously, the Democrats are pushing um, a Medicare for all or public option type plan, um, but what that continues to do and what, what Obamacare, the current system has done, is really move us away from a patient-centered um, healthcare plan where patients are in charge of their healthcare decisions, their healthcare dollars. Um, we have choice and competition and, and price transparency. Um, those options exist. Uh, and and we need to educate Americans that in spite of the fact that Obamacare has been challenged three times in the in the Supreme Court, um, and it is the law of the land, um, that there are uh, alternatives out there that can still uh, we can still uh, utilize whether it's direct primary care um, or or options like that where you have um, cash pay options that bring the cost of health care down. Um, you know, currently we we have a system right now that doesn't incentivize patients to um, to look for lower cost options because mm -hmm. once you pay your premium and meet that deductible, you don't care what it costs. Right. You have you don't care. There's no incentive. 
Um, and so as, as patients, as consumers, we are consumers of healthcare. Um, we should be looking for um, the best options. You know, you think about things like LASIK surgery. It's not covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so people shop for it. And those doctors are competing for your dollars like any other um, like any other business, right, really. Right, right, right. It's a um, marketplace, just like plastic surgery as well, which hasn't gone up significantly uh, the, the way other things have, right? Yeah, and the, and the, the procedures are better. Mm -hmm. um, the, the technology is better. The results are better. Um, and, and that's what you see in a true free market system. Um, now, I know you can't shop for your next heart attack, um, right? You've got to have, you've mm -hmm. got to have some level of insurance. There are options to deal with all of those things, but you can shop for, um, your annual, uh, you know, visit to the doctor. You can shop, uh, you know, have a direct primary care, um, doctor where you're paying. Um, and, and just for your viewers to understand what direct primary care is, it is literally moving out of an insurance-based system and having a relationship with your physician where you pay them like a monthly membership fee. It's almost like a gym membership, I guess, mm -hmm. it's, you know, mm -hmm. $30, anywhere from 30 to $60 a month. Um, and you have access to your doctor all the time. Um, you text your doctor, you can do telehealth, um, but it's having that doctor patient relationship where you and your doctor are making your decisions and you're in charge. It's not, um, a hospital system, a big bureaucratic mm -hmm. hospital system that's being driven by the bureaucracy that's been created by right. Obamacare. Um, and and that, that will put people back in charge. Um, it's unfortunate. I hope that people don't learn that they don't have that doctor-patient relationship when they uh, are sick and they need it um, because we're starting to see more delays like in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, and, and so if we can move to that type of system and help people understand that there are uh, options to a single payer system, um, because Americans really just want it to be, uh, to work, uh, right. to be easy mm -hmm. and to be affordable, right? Um, and so we can do that. Uh, it doesn't have to be single payer and we're smart enough as Americans um, to want to be and, and understand our own healthcare. Right, absolutely. I think that's one of the, I'm glad you brought it up because that's one of the biggest, most inefficient marketplaces in, in the entire country. I mean, it almost doesn't make sense that one hospital can charge you like hundreds of dollars to take Advil, and then another hospital can charge you a significantly different rate for a different procedure. Uh, it, it's literally not a free market. And because you're right, if, if the free market capitalist side doesn't make compelling arguments as to why this will be a better, uh, and doesn't come up with proposals as to why... Um, approaching things through a free market way through a capitalist way like you buy everything else if they don't make that argument properly we are going to end up with a situation like canada or the uk uh or or some of these other countries were completely inefficient and you know if you have you, you need a what they call elective procedure which is something that you need to get done just not a, that won't kill you today uh you're waiting months or years for it right right and just to give you an example of the difference between first of all you're absolutely right we do not have a free market system right now it is by no means even close to one um but we're not single payer either so we can make the change but just to give you an example of the difference between a cash pay system or direct uh primary care system versus an insurance based system so if you go to a direct primary care um, doctor and you get, you know, sort of your annual physical and you do the blood test, you know, like an annual blood test where they do the full panel um, and kind of look at your cholesterol and all those fun things. Um, that test through a direct primary care physician um, costs about $4. Just $4. Mm -hmm. Um, if you bill it through an insurance company and you go to your regular direct, regular primary care doctor and they go through the big insurance company, it's about a hundred dollar billing. Mm. So that $96 are all middlemen taking their cuts all along the way. Um, and so if we can get rid of those middlemen and bring your doctor and you back together and move everybody out from the middle, then we can not only improve care in this country, but improve access in this country and, and make it affordable along the way. Amen. That would be amazing. We, uh, something that we, we definitely need to focus on. And I'm glad you guys are doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for being with me, Elaine. Where can uh, people find you and learn more about the Job Careers Network? 
they can go to jobcreatorsnetwork.com. Um, they can join the organization if they're a small business owner. They don't have to be a small business owner to join the organization. Um, uh, and they can keep up on everything that we're doing. They can support our efforts as well. Um, and they can get involved. There are different level, different levels of membership um, where you can be directly involved. We actually have small business owners um, who are so involved, they actually um, testify in Congress on various issues um, before committees and subcommittees. Um, some of them actually appear in the media um, and we work with them on those issues because there's nobody more credible than the people in the trenches, right? So they can talk about mm -hmm. how taxes, higher taxes will impact them. Um, and so there's various ways they can be involved. That's great. Well, especially that, I mean, having uh, politicians actually speak to regular people instead of lobbyists with a, uh, with a concept. <laughs> exactly. Well, great. Thanks so much for, for being with us. I think it's a really fascinating discussion uh, on, on all sorts of the, the issues affecting our economy and, and what we need to seriously focus on as we go forward. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed our show, please click subscribe to stay up to date with our YouTube channel and podcast, and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts so that we can keep delivering guys some great content. Thanks for listening, and we will be back next week. We're going to talk about the issues that really matter. Our country, our economy, the Fed, QE, GDP, BTC, NFTs, AOC, the CCP, Cardi B, Ow. Yeezy, Yellow Socks, Iran, Joe Biden's dementia, Come on, man. and probably sex robots. We stand for a free and open debate and exchange of ideas. And if you disagree with anything we talk about, you are a racist and no better than Hitler. What? Let's get started.